Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture. Thank you to our artists in residence, Dupre and Barry Kornhauser. We are honored to have these great musicians as members of our society and our community. My name is Beverly Roller, and I'm the president here at Brooklyn Ethical. We begin our program with the lighting of the candles, and I invite you to read along with me. Do we have a slide? Each week, we light candles of understanding against the shadows of our times. This for us is a sign of our standing together with people who have sought goodness, sometimes at great risk. I am thrilled to be presiding at this platform today and to welcome our special guest speaker, Maya Wiley. I need my glasses. I, was, I, I would also like to welcome the other ethical societies who, who have joined us to, today. Among those are the Long Island Society, Westchester, and Riverdale, as well as the many others who are attending this program. And I offer a special welcome to those who are here with Brooklyn Ethical for the first time. One of the reasons I'm excited about today's program is that I am a big fan of Maya. While she is known for so many reasons, I came to know her from her frequent appearances on MSNBC, while she was there as a contributor and as a legal analyst. But her accomplishments are many. She has spent her career fighting to dismantle structural racism and to win transformational change with low income communities of color. From the ACLU, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, to founding the Center for Social Inclusion, a national policy strategy organization working with community-based and national organizations for equity. As counsel to the mayor, she delivered for New York City on, new, on civil rights and immigrant rights, women and minority owned business contracts and more. As chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, she brought more accountability to police discipline and worked to improve public education as a co-chair of the School Diversity Task Force. At the new school, where she currently serves as a university professor, she founded the Digital Equity Laboratory on universal and inclusive broadband. Given the events of the last several months, where police misconduct, generally unseen, became visible to all of us and resulted in widespread dissent and a groundswell of protest in New York City, the country and even around the world, now could not be a more appropriate time to have a program focused on police reform and restructuring law enforcement. Most recently, we've been witness to police brutality directed against children, and I mean children of color, in a series of horrific and upsetting incidents. This must end, as must all racial injustice. As someone who has worked to address the inherent inequities in our city, our society, and our institutions, Maya brings a perspective that along with others devoted to this work, brings hope for real change. More and more women of color are becoming agents of change from within the circles of our lives, in community organizations, in government, and in every other area of society. And now, potentially, in the White House. It is with this in mind that I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Maya Wiley. Thank you. I am I'm so honored to be here with you all this morning and particularly humbled that you would ask me to speak about such a critically important topic. I thought I wanna first thank our musical opening uh, because 
you know, Rise Up is one of my favorite songs. Uh, I was just listening to Andrew Day's version yesterday. It's definitely something that helps get me through those feelings of overwhelm when we have to move mountains. And one of the things that we have to confront as a mountain that must be moved right now in society across this country, but also particularly in New York City, is the mountain of fear. And I'm starting this conversation about police reform and restructuring on fear because so much of why we have the policing we have today that has created so much trauma, so much tension, uh, so many constitutional violations has really been enabled by fear and particularly fear of crime and some of the stories that we tell ourselves to feel less afraid. You know, one of those stories that we tell ourselves is that if we have more police officers, we will have less crime, we will be more safe. You know, the research doesn't bear that out, um, but let me give you a couple of points that have underscored this even in recent history. So in 2014, when I served as counsel to Mayor Bill de Blasio, it's a very challenging year because that was the summer of 2014 when Eric Garner was killed by Daniel Pantaleo in a chokehold that was not part of police training, that was not part of any normal protocol. And while we didn't have enough of a discussion about why was, why was he being arrested in the first place when the only allegation, and it wasn't even proven, it was an allegation, was that he was selling an untaxed cigarette on the street. Uh, no history of violent crime, uh, and certainly someone who was struggling to make ends meet uh, and had a number, a number both of health challenges uh, and a lot of other factors that are just frankly just about poverty. But putting that aside, after his killing, and we saw demonstrations across the city that for me were very reminiscent of the demonstrations we've been seeing after George Floyd. And we also saw work stoppages by the police department, by rank and file police officers, apparently at the request of the police union, the Police Benevolent Association, or at least with a wink and a nod. And the work slowed down. They stopped, they stopped, they, they greatly reduced the policing that they were doing. And guess what happened? Crime rates continued to go down during the work stoppage. And there's a coupling between these two things because our fear of crime, so even at a time, it, if you think about the, the history of our crime rates over the past three decades, they've been dropping rapidly and dramatically and staying relatively low. No crime rate states even, you know, we, we tend to get, you know, looks more like an EKG on a heart monitor. Uh, but the question is, do you have big spikes and do they stay high? Uh, we tend to get little spikes and they stay low and they come back down again. And this has been true for decades. And even though that was crime rates were starting to drop in the 1990s, we were increasing the police budget. We were increasing the size of force. Uh, and that is something that required examination and that many researchers said, you know, actually, there's no research that says you're safer because you add more uniforms and badges to the street. But at the same time that we were increasing as crime rates were coming down, our fear was also leading to what seems like a logical conclusion, which is if crime rates are coming down, it is because we are adding more police officers, not because they're coming down for other reasons. And there's a lot of debate about the drop in crime rates. And the probability is that there are many reasons that crime rates dropped. But one thing we do know is that they were dropping before we were expanding the number of police officers. And so that's why we should ask ourselves the question of, you know, what are we afraid of? How real is our fear? And how do we then address the things that are creating it? And let me just tell you the, about fear, uh, particularly today, because in the wake of the COVID pandemic, you know, which is also just blown off the curtains 
uh, and blown the window wide open on systemic racism and just how communities of color in particular become both the essential workers and the folks in conditions that are most likely to result in illness and death. That the, as well as the folks who are often keeping hospitals running, keeping stores open for groceries, making sure that uh, folks are getting picked up in ambulances and taken to emergency rooms, that these are the kinds of jobs uh, that are often um, people of color in this city. And that uh, the death rates were often twice to three times as likely to be black and Latino in this city. And you could track that to poverty. So that was fearful, uh, but it also has meant tremendous job loss. I'm gonna come back to this theme about what's going on with COVID in a minute, um, but there's no question that we've had tremendous fear and insecurity, tremendous humanitarian crisis that is created, and, it's, and communities of color have been ground zero, as we have all been affected, no matter our race or our class, but ground zero in terms of the, the hardest and biggest brunt of this incredible pandemic. But one of the things that has happened now that is producing more fear, and therefore uh, a pushback on the conversation about what we do about policing when we've seen ballooning police budgets without any real smart analysis about what keeps us safe, and to what extent blue uniforms and badges do that, and what else we need, which is what demonstrators are we're pointing our attention to is Deval Gardner Jr., who was a one-year-old child who took a bullet to the stomach on a playground at a barbecue with his family. And, you know, I attended the vigil for Davel and I went to the viewing. Uh, and this is his story, unfortunately, is not new, and it is also not uncommon in some of our neighborhoods. And as the same neighborhoods who were victimized by a stop and frisk set of policing policies that almost never recovered a weapon, let alone a gun. I think the stat was literally 0.01% of all the black and Latino kids being thrown up against walls and frisked, often without any probable cause uh, of, of any crime being committed that were very, very, very unlikely to even have a weapon, let alone be arrested as a result of that stop. That these are also the same communities that often have the disproportionately high gun violence that is also victimizing young kids. And a reality in our communities and in these communities is illegal guns are a huge problem. They're often a problem not because of our own local laws, but because of a lack of state and federal gun control. But it's also easier to get a gun than a job in many of these communities. And in a time of COVID, when we were talking about communities that were already experiencing, in some instances, 14% unemployment rates for kids between 18 and 24 before COVID, at the time when we were celebrating just how low unemployment was, that that was not universally true. And now during COVID, we're seeing 25%, 30% unemployment, and in these communities, much, much higher. And we're also seeing trauma, the trauma of loss, the trauma of death, the trauma that comes with a pandemic that is seeing communities not only unable to have recreation, not only in overcrowded housing conditions, but also increasing financial insecurity at a time when they already suffered from financial insecurity. And those things are the things that research has always pointed us to when we see increase in crime. In fact, the more jobs you have, the fewer the crime rate, the fewer the violent crimes. And even in New York City, what we have seen, and I've dug into this data on 911 calls, you know, we had about 15 million 911 calls over the course of a year, and roughly 1 million of those were for serious or critical crimes, 1 million out of 15 million. So that tells us a couple of things that demonstrators have already been telling us. 
so many of those calls and so much of our fear even, because it's not just shooting. I was just having, having a, a lunch with a friend who lives in Chelsea yesterday. And we were talking about the homeless shelter that's been opened near them. And the fear that's been created in the community because unfortunately it is true that a number of people who live on the streets, who we see the visible homeless, are mentally ill and often seriously mentally ill. And that has created more fear of, of housing the homeless in these shelters uh, in some communities. That's true of the Upper West Side as well. But the reality is then, as protesters have said, if our concern is, you know, there's some place, we need focus on illegal guns. Yes, we do. We need to get them off our streets. What we really need, when we think about the conditions that create our societal problems, is jobs. We need mental health services. We need a crisis management unit that is the one that can be called when someone is having a mental health issue and is on the street yelling and needs someone who is trained, who is an expert in helping to manage that uh, crisis, not escalate it with a gun and a badge. And in all fairness to police officers, it's not their job, it's not their training. And we keep pouring money into training police officers to be mental health workers rather than paying mental health workers to be mental health workers. And that's something that we have to change. So we need to recognize, number one, that the police do have a job to do and that there's a way to do it better. I call it, uh, it's not my uh, name for it. It is uh, the researchers who develop the name, but problem-oriented policing, where police are often uh, better able to, to see first where there are hot spots, where there are repeat problems. And what those problems are and what some of the underlying causes are, because they do know, they do talk to community, and they can help partner with other agencies of government to address the underlying problem. Just think of Eric Garner, untaxed cigarettes, misdemeanor at best, usually gonna result in you getting, all he had to receive was a summons to show up in court. He didn't need to be arrested. But at the end of the day, the real issue is that was a corridor where sh shop owners were complaining that their business was being taken by low-income people who were hawking things on the street in front of their stores, like untaxed cigarettes. So the question becomes, all right, well, what does the city need to address and do about the fact that the, there are people who are trying to find a way to live by selling untaxed goods on the street out in front of stores that are selling the same goods with, it, with taxes attached to them. That's, that's, a, that's a problem that government collectively should turn its attention to, and police officers, the ones getting the calls, could turn government's attention to them. And Eric Garner might be alive if that happened. But the same thing is true with gun violence. And let me give you the other example. Um, the mental, so the mental health, health issues and the fact that people are more fearful as a result of homelessness and homeless people are on the streets? Well, if we right-size the police department, recognize that only a million of those 15 million calls are for critical or serious crimes in progress, that, that gives us the opportunity to right-size the blue uniforms and the shields and invest in, uh, the, with the resources saved so that they're able to focus on what they should focus on which is illegal guns, which is serious and critical uh, crimes in progress. And then have resources for the other kinds of service systems that, that can be crisis management response, like mental health issues, mental distress, uh, disputes. There's a whole category in the call data that's disputes. Those disputes often need someone who can help mediate a dispute, not someone who has a gun and a badge. And those kinds of flying squads could exist of mental health professionals, uh, of people who are trained in mediation. And in fact, when we think of gun violence, uh, you know, there's a, there's a model of community crisis management. It has many different names and they're different, uh, and there takes different forms. We have about, I believe we have about 20 to 22 of them in communities around this city a dramatic record of reducing gun violence because what they are, are community members, often who themselves have been incarcerated for violent felonies, not nonviolent felonies, violent felonies. 
they're engaged, they're trained and supported to be crisis intervention in the communities they live in and know. And, they, and when a kid is killed, like a Devell Gardner Jr., and the candles start appearing at altars where, some, where, a, where a young person has been shot and killed, what they know is they have to go and look at the candles and track back every candle to who put the candle there, to understand who needs some crisis and trauma intervention, who needs support so that it doesn't become an angry retribution shooting. And also they get called to know when their tensions and where they are so that they can mediate before it becomes a crisis. And I have actually done some site visits with, with some of these models also in Chicago, which is where some of them started. And I can tell you that a lot of them, what they become are navigators to the social services and supports that people need to prevent even further opportunity for violence in the future. So I say that because it's not that we don't know what works. It's not that we don't have mechanisms that help it solve multiple problems, like helping people who are formerly incarcerated find the pride and joy in serving their community in ways that preserve life and create more opportunity for people. That we, that we have ways to create hope and reduce fear for those who are mentally ill and struggling and without their medications on the street and finding ways to help them be in housing and be able to stay in it, but with the services they need to support it, that those are the things that make us all actually safer. And that what we need from our police department is to understand that we need a right sizing. And we also need to invest appropriately in the kinds of calls the police department has getting Get, is getting that they don't even like receiving or responding to. And that's a win-win because that increases safety for police officers, it increases safety for communities, and it ensures that we're actually investing in long-term solutions, not short-term interventions that result in other problems, like people who have been incarcerated and can't get jobs coming out of the other end of the system. The last thing I will say, because I really want to make sure we're able to have a conversation, is um, civilian oversight. You know, as you heard, I chaired the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, which uh, receives complaints of misconduct. Um, when, when people choose to file them, no one is required to file a complaint with, with the CCRB. But uh, it's so critically important that people do. One, because that oversight means the data, the aggregate data, the patterns, which precincts have the highest number of complaints, that's all public. And tracking those patterns of problem is very important because we've had a serious transparency problem at times with the police department itself, as we know. But I'm also gonna tell you that it was incredibly frustrating. And what was frustrating about it, uh, and I, I, I actually have a lot of relationships with police officers, who I became very good friends with in City Hall. They were people, they're people. They're people who showed me pictures of their children, who I showed pictures of my children. We shared parenting tips. We talked about our, our you know, our struggles with teenage daughters. We, we talked about the struggles of school. Like, at, we're all people. Um, and those relationships are so important. And I came to understand some of their frustration. And a lot of it was they did feel misunderstood. They did recognize that there were police officers doing bad things, but almost to a person, they had stories of being treated badly on the job by management within the police department. And even after Eric Garner, it very quickly shifted to labor conditions, traditional labor conditions, just like we'd have if we were talking about factory workers on a factory floor. But one of the things that that really said to me is one, you know, civilian oversight of misconduct is critically important and it matters. And I'm really proud that we got, you know, one of the things I was able to do before I left is send the Daniel Pantaleo case for charges over to the police department and demand that our civilian prosecutors, not on the payroll of the police department, be the ones to prosecute the case. It's a unique power of our CCRB. Should be committed to law and not just a memorandum of understanding. It's part of why I had to fight about it. But we won that fight and Daniel Pantaleo is gone many years too late. But 
the real issue is civilian oversight on the front end, on the policies, procedures, and priorities of policing so that it's focused on problems, it's focused on how the police can be partners in government and with community in solving and preventing, and it's, and it's oversight that then ensures that we aren't held hostage to fear because one of the things that the police unions and also even as we've seen with Commissioner Shea, who I've been very public needs to be fired, what we have seen is a, a manipulation of fear very similar to what I see from Donald Trump himself that says, just trust us and don't question us. Do as we say. And by the way, if you are critical of us, as we saw with Derek Ingram, the Black Lives Matter activist, who was besieged for six hours from police officers in riot gear with helicopters overhead and not even a warrant for his arrest for a bullhorn at a protest was all about police. That was a whole different level of police abuse. That wasn't physical in that moment, but it was part of a tremendous threat to what democratic society demands, which is that it's not we the police department, it's we the people. And the police have to be accountable to us and can't use that power or that data to drive fear that says, don't, you can't question us, you can't criticize us, and you can't demand that we change. When the conversation should be, we're all people, we all deserve dignity, Police officers deserve dignity in the job, just like a factory worker. But dignity doesn't translate into you get to do whatever you want, whenever you want, because you personally think it's the right thing to do. We have to be the ones who say what the priorities are. We have to be able to say we need to right size this because it's wrong sized right now. And we need to be able to say, the orientation has to be problem solving. It has to be investments in community. And I'll give you one more anecdote before, before I close, because it's so important. Even in the debates that we just saw in the last city council um, hearings around the budget, uh, and there's lots of critique about the fact that it wasn't real cuts to the NYT, it wasn't real deep cuts to NYPD budget. And as we see, as we're talking about layoff of workers, we're not, we're, there's no mandate to NYPD on, on similar types of layoffs, even though they've had an increase in police budget and policing size over the last five years when everyone else was not. And that is a problem. But when you look at what's happening around where they are cutting, they were required to cut overtime. And I was at a public housing uh, development in the South Bronx uh, two weeks ago talking to residents and they have a community center there and one of the things that is so important about that community center and it's a beautiful community center they're one of the lucky developments is that they have a nonprofit organization that has all kinds of events particularly in the evenings for the kids who live in the developments they have basketball they have all kinds of things going on there they relied on the community policing units they're called ncos it's a specific unit of uh, New York City Police Department precincts. It's not all police officers, not all police officers are community policing. It's a big problem that we have to change. But these units are really uh, actually quite beloved often, I'm finding from residents, because they not only make people feel safe from violence when they're having the activity, they participate in the activities. They're not just standing around like a police force with guns ready to pull the guns out and shoot. They're playing basketball with the kids. And people feel safer because they're there, not because they're policing there. And the overtime cuts meant that the NCO unit in the South Bronx public housing, housing development were told they couldn't do it anymore because their overtime was cut. That was not the message from demonstrators. The message from demonstrators is, you know, make sure we're investing in community programs. And this was a cut that actually cut the very 
kind of policing that people were embracing that was building relationships and trust, but that also was not the traditional form of policing and was enabling some of the other programs that community needed and wanted and that invested in that community. So I say that because there isn't even a lot of transparency around how they're cutting and whether it's the right things or the wrong things. Because what I'm starting to see is prioritizing the cuts that have been made are exactly wrong. They're not the priorities that we would set as we the people. So that means a strong mayor who's willing to put in the right leadership in the police department that has the right principles, the right values. It means establishing the oversight at the beginning, dictating what police patrol guide says is and is not okay. Not accepting when the police tell us what is and isn't okay. We've seen this model in Camden. We've seen it in other places. It's doable. It does mean that police unions cannot dictate beyond labor conditions so that they are, can't hold sway over policy and priorities. That's just simply not a labor condition unto itself. And they certainly can't protect police from violating our constitutional rights by creating these protections and collective bargaining that not one of us would get in our own court system. That makes no sense. So there are many, many things we could do, but it does require that we recognize that fear is the mountain that we must move, that hope is what must be ascendant. And hope, by hope, I mean a passion for what is, what is possible. It's the Kierkegaardian sense of hope. And that passion for possibility is that even with limited resources, we can be so much smarter about our investments. We can make those investments ethical, moral. They, they, can, com they can completely build community rather than tear it down. They can save lives rather than imprison them. And that we can have a vastly different city where we all feel safe no matter whether we have a big bank account or no bank account at all. And that, that is fundamentally the opportunity we have now. And we have to step into it boldly. We have to rise up. We have to move that mountain and we will. And I'll stop there.